And let's go ahead and dive into our art class for today. We are going to be drawing a mule and illustrating the number 40. So we'll be making a composition to illustrate this, this concept of 40 acres and a mule. And just by show of hands, has anybody heard about the concept of 40 acres and a mule before? A couple people, a couple people, not at all. Awesome. Perfect. So I'm going to actually show a couple videos because that, uh, YouTube can illustrate this much better than I. And it'll give us a little bit of historical context for this idea. All right, here we go. He was so sudden on them, they wasn't prepared for it. Recalled one liberated slave. Just think of whole droves of people that had hardly ever left the plantation turned loose all at once with nothing in the world but the clothes on their back. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had freed slaves across the South. But Washington still had no clear plan for what to do once African Americans were free. On January 11th, President Lincoln sent his Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton, to Savannah. Stanton instructed General Sherman to set up a meeting with some of the city's black ministers. He wanted to hear how the freedmen imagined their future in the South. That evening, 20 black men entered the Grand Parlor as guests of Stanton and Sherman. 16 were former slaves. They chose Reverend Garrison Frazier, who had purchased his freedom nine years earlier, to be their spokesman. For the first time, federal officials conferred with freed slaves about the future of African Americans in the South. The exchange that occurs between Sherman Stanton and the Union generals and Reverend Frazier is one of the extraordinary moments of the Civil War and the ending of the Civil War. Because they asked Frazier not just what should we do with all these refugees, they asked him questions about what the war meant. They asked him questions about what the Emancipation Proclamation had meant. They asked him what the presence of black troops in the Union Army meant. And in many ways you'll find no better definition of the meaning of the Civil War and the kinds of answers that Garrison Frazier gives that day in Savannah. The freedom, as I understand it, promised by the Emancipation Proclamation, is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we could reap the fruit of labor. To be a slave, one of these ministers pointed out to General Sherman, is to be someone who had no control over his life's decisions. And now, these people feel the need to express their abilities, their choices. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land. And we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to we want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. This was a man who never left probably a coastal Georgia in his life. But he understood the Declaration of Independence. He understood the Emancipation Proclamation. And beyond that, he said, in effect, you should give us our rights and you should protect our rights. And then you should leave us alone and let us be citizens. Four days later, anxious to get thousands of freed slaves off his hands and Washington off his back, General Sherman issued Special Field Order 15. It was only a temporary order, but it became one of the most controversial of the Civil War. Plantations in the rice country had been abandoned by white planters during the war. 400,000 of these acres would be given over to African Americans for settlement. The huge land tract included the Sea Islands and parts of the Georgia and South Carolina coast. 
40 acres of land will be given out to each family. Plus, Sherman says, the Army's got tons of mules, which we don't really need. They're broken down from our long march. If anyone wants a mule, they can have one of these mules. This is the origin of that famous phrase, 40 acres and a mule. It was a real revolution. A revolution in the land, on the land. A chance to, to be their own freeholders. For four million African Americans in the South, news of 40 acres and a mule spread as fast as the contagion of freedom itself. Many saw this as proof that emancipation would finally give black men and women a true stake in the land they had toiled on for centuries. So it's estimated today that that 40 acres and a mule would be worth at least $6.4 trillion. And one thing that really um, blew my mind was after listening to the podcast 1619, which was um, produced by the New York Times, I believe. Um, what, yeah, New York Times uh, 1619 project. Um, enslaved people were used as collateral for mortgages centuries before the home mortgage became the defining characteristic in middle America. Uh, in fact, the way that America as a newfound country gained international credit with England and, you know, the, the rest of the, the known world at the time was they used these mortgages of black bodies to show everyone else that they that they had some some capital because of course they were using these body these black people's lives as a financial you know um, currency that is what made america a player if if it wasn't for these black people there would be no america not only because they physically like did the the labor of creating wealth especially in the south but also because they're just the idea and the the seen value of this this human um capital ugh, uh was was what enabled us to become the country that we are today so when what's you the hear, name of that podcast it's called 1619 and it is a must listen it's an absolutely beautiful um overview of or it's beautifully told it's a beautiful overview of a, a horrifying story and it goes from the first time a slave was uh, purchased in america which is in the year 1619 up to the present moment and it traces how of course the, the middle passage how people were taken from africa through what slavery was like um a little bit, but not a lot of what happened after slavery. And it also talks about land ownership um, today and how people have been very clearly discriminated against, especially in the South, and just the implications of what it means to specifically um, be racially discriminatory about land ownership. There is so much power in land ownership. And um, that is one of the key arguments in the conversations about reparations. And that's really what I wanted to bring up today is that idea of reparations. And it's, when I first thought of this subject, I was like, this is such a big, scary subject. I don't even know how we're gonna wrap our minds around it. Um, but the more I've been researching, there's such a precedent for reparations to peoples who have been, um, you know, terribly uh, wronged. So of course, after World War II, the creation of the state of Israel, was reparations along with, I believe, over $40 billion uh, that Germany gave um, in reparations to, to Jewish people. Uh, after World War II, also the Japanese were given reparations after what was done to their, uh, to their groups in the internment camps, in the concentration camps. So it, it, there is a history of America recognizing when it has wronged or when other countries have wronged um, a group of people 
And that is, is done, yes, through financial means, but it also tends to spark a conversation, a um, kind of moral uh, coming to terms. And I think from, if you listen to that 1619 podcast, and if you continue, we'll listen to some other um, videos later. Well, one, at least one other video today, just the conversation alone of that. Yeah, we did something really wrong. And here's how we're going to try and do one something to make up for it. Um, it can start to happen. So it's a big subject and we're just going to, we're going to draw a little mule, which feels very insignificant <laughs> in the big scheme of things. But do y'all have any uh, immediate thoughts while I get our little art class ready real quick? Is it important now to say what happened about all that land being taken back? I mean, you know, oh. it sound, sounded like a great scheme, but from what I, you know, have the little bit I've studied is that, it was all undone very quickly. Exactly. So, of course, we know Abraham Lincoln was assassinated um, just months after this special order uh, was approved by, by Lincoln. Um, and his predecessor, uh, Andrew Jackson, was very conservative, and he canceled the special order. He reversed it. And so what had happened is all of these freed people had converged in the South and they were ready to create what they were considering was going to be a country within a country. They said, you know what? We don't feel that the time is right. This was the conversation that was had with, um, in that special group of 20 uh, that, that made the decision of what to do post uh, civil war. Um, they said, we would rather not live amongst white people. We think things are too dangerous for us right now. They're, the racial tensions are too high. We just want to have our own space where black people can do our thing and, you know, we'll go from there. Um, so that was going to be that slice of land uh, from the Carolinas down to Jacksonville. And what happened was that land was given back to Confederate soldiers and they came back and they forced the people who had begun working that land to be their um, surf, oh. surf, you know, what do you call it? Indentured servants, basically. So it, it realigned into a new form of slavery, slavery by another name, another good book. That was, yeah. So it's a tragic story. And what I think is so important about, um, this history is for us as anti-racist, you know, it goes back to that idea of looking at policies instead of people. If you just take a fresh look at the world and you knew nothing about history or how things came to be the way they are, then it would be easy for a person to say, oh, well, these people of color must be, you know, all of the horrible racist things you hear, uh, lazy, stupid, blah, blah, blah. They have gotten themselves into this situation. Whereas if you look at the policies from an anti-racist perspective, you can see that there is a history of the um, ability of people to have equal opportunities uh, that have been taken from them time and time again. This is a precedent that was continued over time. So yes, you're free, but we're not gonna give you any property. And in fact, we're going to kind of put you back in the same situation. Did we say we were going to give you an equal opportunity with this land and a mule? Sorry, just kidding. And so on and so on up until the present day. So reparations is giving, yes. Um, and now the conversation, there are, there are still uh, people working on this. There's a book I want to read. I just heard about it. It's called um, From Here to Equity, I want to say. There was a special on this on NPR just last night. But they're considering how to continue the conversation of reparations, it would be options of maybe having land for some people, trust funds for some people, like actual money for others. Um, so there are different forms that reparations could, could take. And again, one of the most important things is the reckoning, the moral and ethical reckoning of um, the conversation of like, yeah, this happened. Um, black people were treated incredibly unfairly and never given a fair shot. And we're sorry. It's as simple as that. 
a simple and complex for those of us whose ancestors arrived, you know, never in the South and well after all of that happened. I mean, there, I, I can That's an interesting hear point. that voice rising up in me, and certainly I hear it in other people, too. Sure. Well, what's the class that you teach? I'm sorry? What's the class that you teach? Oh, I, well, I, I'm a movement teacher, but the group that I was talking about online now is a, is, is a peer group. I organize it, but um, I started it, but it's a peer group of people who get together to draw based on yeah. Steiner's calendar of the soul. Is that what you're talking about? No, it was when you told the story about your Japanese student coming up to you after Oh, class. oh, oh, um, Japanese student. No. Said oh, about the, oh, uh, not, not today, the allies. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, I taught for 19 years at the Barbara Brennan School of Healing. So we had, we had students from 50 different countries, some of whom had previously, you, you know, they were young enough not to have been alive mostly during the war, but, um, but whose countries had been at war. You know, Italians were there as well as Japanese and Germans mm -hmm. and Thank so you. I've been uh, mulling over that that uh, point of, you know, what about the fact that people have been coming from there and, you know, obviously nobody who is alive today was a part of the, the choice for slavery. Um, but I think it goes back to that the birth of America itself was mortgaged on on black bodies that we stole. So there would be no America for people to immigrate to or to come to if it wasn't for that okay. initial um, mm -hmm. robbery of, and, and you know, uh, dis this valuation of, of people's lives as inherent, mm -hmm. inherently valuable as humans and instead only seeing them as, as property. Um, so I think that's a huge part of it. And there are other videos that I'll definitely have to post because I've been watching so many and hearing so many arguments both for and against. It's such a hot topic. And it was something I was really anxious about even covering or learning about because it doesn't feel, it's not an easy thing to just say, oh yeah, that makes sense if you're coming from a position of white privilege anyway. Um, so I, I definitely invite you to take this as just the springboard for more research and um, discussion. And let me pop up so we have enough time to draw. It goes so quickly. All these interesting things to say. First of all, I didn't really even know what a mule was <laughs> when I started looking this up. And so it turns out a mule is when you have a male donkey and a female horse. And you get a, some of the benefits of both whenever you get a mule. Um, is it always a male? Yes, it has to be a male uh, horse. I'm sorry, was that right? A no, male no, donkey. No. Thank you. I had it backwards. No, no. Is the result, is, it, is the oh, no. mule always a male? No, it, they can be both. Um, they have slightly different terms whenever you refer to them. Like there's like a henny or something. If, it, if there's a male horse with a female donkey, it's called something different. So it has to be a male donkey with a female horse. Um, mules typically cannot breed, like after they've created the, the mule, that's kind of the end of the line, because they are two different species. Um, so they are able to breed just the ones. But they are really good for, of course, uh, work or around farms. They're working animals. Um, and... Here's, here's some cute ones. So we're going to definitely talk about how to draw a mule. And They're just a little so bit cute. here. They are. This is interesting. This is like selling mules. I, I got the best looking mules I could find. It was hard to find some good pictures of mules. But you can see they tend to have the, the body of a horse with the extremities of a donkey. So really long ears. And sometimes they have kind of a different tail and different, like these. That's different a good animals. one. That's a good one to draw. Cute. Yeah. And the like and Those are my picks. So well, you can choose between which one of these you want to draw. And so my thought for today oh, yeah. was um, what I'm going to do, I've been thinking about how to do a composition that just says 40 acres and a mule. And I'm thinking what I want to do is use some old-fashioned text. 
So there's this 40, or I'm sorry, there's numbers here that are kind of old fashioned looking. And I was looking at, I think, is it this here? Yeah, here's a, another 40 acres and a mule, just image of that phrase. Um, so just to pop some ideas in your head, what I, what I started with, like thinking about how to artistically compose that concept of 40 acres and a mule, is I started with um, a couple really lightly sketched in. Um, really lightly sketched. <laughs> really lightly sketched. <laughs> well, I need to remember I'm putting these on. Normally I would just do these like, uh, you know, in my sketchbook in a place where nobody's gonna see them. And what I ended up doing was I started with, okay, here's, I know I've got a horizontal page. So I started with three little horizontal thumbnails. Thumbnails don't have to be pretty. They don't have to look good. You're just kind of figuring out where you want to put the, the thing on the page. So I started thinking, okay, I'll do it like a giant number 40, and then I'll have like the little mule guy right in front of it. And I mean, you can see this was like literally how <laughs> advanced this drawing was. I'm just thinking about how do I want to compose it? And I thought, that's too hard to see the 40 in the mule. That might be too confusing. What if I do the 40 big? and the, the mule smaller in the corner. And then I could even write the word acres here, 40 acres and a mule. And I kind of like that better. And then I thought, well, wow, I could even do something like from that Pinterest board and do like some kind of scripty thing and do 40 acres and a mule and make it really clear like where everything goes. So I played around with a few different ways of illustrating this. And, I encourage you to do whatever you feel like, you know, you don't have to do exactly what I'm, I'm drawing. Um, I'm, are, we, are we supposed to draw the mule? We're going <laughs> to draw it in just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you have your art supplies with you. Yeah, I do. I mean, okay. my, my, my iPad, but, oh, right. but I'm kind of afraid of drawing a mule. <laughs> sure. I'm going to, I'm going to draw the You're mule. Not the you. only one. Step by step. We'll do it together. <laughs> we'll do it together. Okay. So I'm going to get my sketch pad out. I'm going to do it here on this um, guy. Yeah, I kind of like, because it's exciting to draw a mule, I'm thinking even of trying to do the 40 acres small and the mule big. But Cool. Yeah. Yeah, the mule, I'm going to put him in the corner here. I'm going to make him, you know, medium size because I do want to make the 40 really big. Um, but yeah, let's let's go for it. Let's figure out how to draw this mule. And let me make sure you can see the mule. Such a cute one. And I will be um, here drawing in the corner with you. Hopefully, you can see my. Oh, uh, Kate thing. is so pretty. <laughs> let's do Kate, and then can you make her bigger? Absolutely. Can you yeah. take new out of the picture. Yes. I was thinking the same thing. I, I liked Kate. They're both, those are the two best looking mules by far. <laughs> the lighting on her is better. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just like when you draw anything else in Antonelli Art School, we want to start with the big shapes first. Think about the overall composition. So because I'm fitting this in and I want it to fit in a certain area of the page, I'm just going to think, okay, how does the overall height and the width of where I want this mule to fit on my page. And I'm gonna kind of create a little like rectangle-ish shape. I'm seeing that Kate is actually for the height from her hooves to her back is almost pretty square with her body. And then her head pops out in the height of the head. It's almost as long as the whole body. So I'm kind of using just the height and width of the picture of the mule to help me figure out the overall proportions. And sometimes I ask myself things like, well, what's the halfway point? And if I measure just the legs by themselves, those are a little bit longer than the body. That's surprising. And the head is about equal to the legs. 
So what I have on my paper right now, I'm going to make it darker so you can see. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's kind of the shape right here. I've got a very boxy overall, like this is where I want my mule to fit on the page. Now, I checked out a couple um, mule drawing tutorials. <laughs> They're out there, surprisingly enough. Um, <laughs> it ties into how we talk about drawing anything else whenever you're, you're starting from your big shapes and then building down to details. So the, the first thing that you notice whenever you see the, the mule, like the biggest shape is of course the torso, the overall body. Um, but surprisingly when you're drawing horses or mules, it's almost the way that we draw figures. We look for the um, hips and the, the chest cavity or like the, the broad chest first. And what you want to look for is like a circle or a shape that's going to um, identify where the shoulders and the kind of buttocks are. So I'm making a circle for this area right here, the buttocks. It can be more of a like oval if you think that fits better. And a big, bigger circle here from the top of the shoulder all the way down here to the chest. This is the other big circle that people tend to draw when they're illustrating their donkeys. I'm sorry, mules, mules, donkeys, or horses. So I've got these two big circles and they fit inside of the, the kind of big proportion that I already mapped out. Now from here, I'm noticing there's a little bit of a sway in the back, you know, a little curve that dips down a little lower in the front and then comes back up for Kate's rear end. So I'm going to draw that little curve in to show where her, the back of her bum, or just her overall back is. And I've established this line right here. The, the spine line, the line of the spine. And now I'm going to make some little stick figures for the legs. So I can use my pencil. I can close one eye and hold up the pencil to see like, well, what are the angles of these legs sticking down? In the front leg, it goes backward a little bit and then there's like a little joint there. Off the page. That's not good. Shoot. Go yeah, that's why I like making those, the, out, the outer, I did. I did, but somehow I'm off the page. It is, that, that does happen. So, so I've got two little stick figures for the back legs, and you can see I have little tiny circles just to illustrate where the joint is. And I'm going to do the same thing for the front leg. That front leg that's closer to us is the weight-bearing leg, it looks like. It goes almost straight down. And then her back leg is back a bit. I noticed that the hoof is higher or it appears shorter because it is a little bit farther in the background. So I've got little stick figure legs on my mule. And then I'm gonna draw a circle for the skull. I'm gonna try and make it um, proportional to the rest of the mule. Such a thick neck. I've got this happening. <laughs> it looks off to me and I'm thinking I might need to scooch my oval up and out of my original thing. So mine's growing outside of the original boundaries to Judith. <laughs> no, I'm actually off the page, but I'm just leaving it. Way off the page. You, have the, you and Carol have the patience to go back and start again, and we do it, and I never have the patience for that. No. So here's my, like, very rough <laughs> introduction of more or less the proportions of my mule. And what I also like about laying out these guidelines in the beginning is that as I come in now and I start to actually draw what I see and where the, the contour of the outline of the, the mule is, um, I can make corrections as I go. 
And I feel like you can't do, have a mule though without the ears sticking out though. So two little long triangles were these mule ears. That really makes it look more like something. But um, now I'm gonna go ahead and dive in with some detail lines. The, the contours are a lot more specific around the, the legs, but I think I'm gonna start with the details around the head and then work my way back through the rest of the body. So normally I would have this in a much lighter line. I'll kind of erase a little bit just so I can see what I'm doing. I have a feeling mine is gonna grow when I, I add these more detailed lines in, but let's see. So now I'm really looking and trying to make a likeness of what I'm seeing. I'm looking at things like the negative space, that's the white area in between the ears whenever I try to draw the ears in. And I, I love using negative space and focusing on that silhouette or the empty whiteness around the thing I'm drawing in order to really see where things go. So for example, underneath the head, between the head and the neck, I see a, a triangle. I look at that to be able to draw in, well, what, how, how can I best illustrate that here in this mule? As opposed to focusing only on the head and drawing that way, because that can mess you up. I've got my triangle there. The harness is optional, but that does kind of help um, divide the head. I'll do a little harness action here. And I stick with that pencil trick, so holding my pencil up to the image to figure out the angle. And I'll ask myself, well, is that closer to horizontal, closer to vertical? Oh my gosh, it's almost right at a 45 degree angle coming down from the donkey's neck up over the shoulders. It is much more graceful than my drawing. <laughs> yeah. And I made my, if I follow the angles correctly, I made my um, initial drawing a little too low. So I'm just going to let my new line correct, the incorrect line that was there before. I don't know if y'all can see that. Erase that initial line. Continuing down the body, kind of correcting as I go. So I get the contour of the legs now. So interesting how the anatomy of a horse is so graceful and so different than ours. Our yeah. horse. Yeah. I got my first leg. I'm, I used that um, stick figure version to, to let me know where it was gonna go. What I'm really looking forward for is where the kind of knee is. Um, a nice little marker point to let me know when I'm halfway down how to arrange the contour. I'll do the same thing for the back leg. Also looking at negative space. Negative space is super useful here. Looking at the those long skinny triangles between the... Um, I'm in a class. Between the legs can help you put them in the right, right spot. And I'm looking for relationships. So the hoof at, and the front leg that's farther back is just about equal with that the ankle. I was starting to draw that too low at first and I had to go back and consider the, the relationship there. Legs look so skinny. Mine looks like a little full, maybe more than a real donkey, but it's getting there. Yeah, I, when I was trying to draw San Miguel actual donkeys, I mean, it's amazing how skinny their legs are. Oh, that makes me feel better. This mule has a kind of a cute little pot belly or at least a swoop down for the belly area. I 
And as I'm drawing this now, my back leg kind of scooched into a new position, but I'm still following um, generally where I created that initial land for the leg. Now I'm paying a little bit more attention to the negative space of what I see underneath the, the mule to get it in the right spot. I'm going to follow the contour of the, the rump here and just consider that line as I draw on the back of the leg. It's very curving and it's got really interesting angles happening there. <sighs> the legs are really skipping. You're right. Mm -hmm. For all that, you know, I'm looking back to negative space for the back leg. So I put my leg in the right spot. I'm really trying to draw that triangle of the background, that empty space in between the legs. And if I get that right, the back leg is just going to automatically be in the right spot. The descriptions of these mules were so funny when I, when I was looking to find a good one to draw. I was like, she doesn't like to be ridden unless it's an experienced person, but she loves frolicking in the fields. She doesn't like to be what? Uh, ridden by a human. Uh. Do you blame her? All right, so I've got more or less my overall mule contour kind of outline here. Oop, remember the tail. I'm going to go ahead and erase all the guidelines I drew originally so I can clean this up a little bit. And any other details that you want to add in here? Um, we don't have a ton of time to get super detailed. Of course, please spend time with this as you like. Um, if you got a little time after the, our call today. And I'll definitely post this link to the mule page so you can draw more mules if you are so inclined. Um, I'm just gonna kind, kind of do just some very general shading maybe give a suggestion of where the hooves go. Um, one thing, and this is for any anybody that you're drawing, if it's a mule or a person, if you shade the back leg darker than the front leg, it'll give a stronger sense of depth and perspective. So I'm gonna shade the leg that's farther away darker on this donkey, excuse me, mule. <laughs> Let's see how many of you can do that. That gives a little bit more sense of depth. How's everybody's mule coming along? <laughs> oh my god, I think like if mules saw my drawing, they would be very <laughs> offended. <laughs> like, seriously, this is bad. <laughs> oh no. Can you hold it up and Oh my god, like <laughs> this is ridiculous. Like, okay. <laughs> I just have to say that I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> oh, it's cute. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's 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 not uh, like we can't say. I'm sorry, let me pop her up here. 
Oh, it's cute. <laughs> it's happy. It looks so, like a very, very sweet mule. Oh my God, I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I think the main thing you're missing is um, some of the really, uh, the, the anatomy basically. And so with, yeah. yeah, with horses, they have these strange legs that go back and then forward. And then there's this little thing here. And it's just, it takes a lot, a lot of attention to the tiny little like angles. Yeah. Um, I tried to do that, but, but yeah, definitely it's missing the point. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just think he's so cute though. He's such a happy mule. <laughs> Can you put Kate back up? Yes. And I tell you what, would y'all be okay with um, listening to a speech about um, reparations for the yes. yeah. line a little bit? I'm going to go ahead and just play this and we can listen. I feel a sense of anger where we are in the United States of America where we have not had direct conversations about a lot of the root causes of the inequities and the pain and the hurt manifested in economic disparities, manifested in health disparities, manifested in a, a, a criminal justice system that is indeed a form of new Jim Crow. And so we as a nation have not yet truly acknowledged and grappled with racism and white supremacy that has tainted this country's founding and continues to persist in those deep racial disparities and inequalities today. This is a very important hearing. It is historic, it is urgent. I look at communities like mine and you could literally see how communities were designed to be segregated, designed uh, based upon uh, enforcing institutional uh, racism and inequities. We know that racialized violence and terrorism has persisted from reconstruction well into the 1950s as my friend Brian Stevenson's National Memorial for Peace and Justice shows. We've seen bombings of churches, we've seen massacres, at places as recently as the Emanuel AME Church just four years ago, the stain of slavery was not just inked in bloodshed, but in the overt state-sponsored policies that fueled white supremacy and racism and have disadvantaged African Americans economically for generations. Many of the bedrock policies, in fact, that ushered generations of Americans into the middle class were designed to exclude African Americans from the GI Bill to Social Security intentionally designed to exclude blacks, as was school segregation, redlining, neighborhoods like the one in which I live, which were by design, walled off and disinvested in. And while these policies of the past, uh, uh, their damage and their reality has endured across generations and have created and led to so much of the racial wealth gaps uh, in our country. Right now, we see cities like Boston, where the average white family has somewhere around $240,000 in wealth, and the average black family has about $8 in wealth. Health outcomes also vary widely by race. National black women are nearly four times as likely to die from pregnancy complications as white women, and in so many other areas. Our criminal justice system as well. No difference between blacks and whites for using drugs or selling drugs but African-Americans are about four times more likely to be arrested. These injustices do not just cause injustice for African-Americans. It enforces a deep injustice in our nation as a whole. It is a cancer on the soul of our country and hurts the whole body politic, making us all less wealthy, making us all less just, making us all fall far short from being who we say we are when we swear an oath that this will be a nation of liberty and justice for all. I believe this is an urgent moment and this bill, which I am now leading on the Senate side, is the beginning of an important process, not just to examine and study this history that has not been addressed, the silence that persists, but also to find practical ideas to address the enduring injustices in our nation. The characterizations of such an effort that I hear from others is wrong and undermines our collective purpose and common ground. This idea that it's just about writing a check from one American to another falls far short of the importance of this conversation. Today I'm drawing a mule. I say that I am brokenhearted and angry right now. 
decades of living in a community where you see how deeply unfair this nation is still to so many people who struggle, who work hard, who do everything right but still find themselves disproportionately with lead in their water, super funds in their neighborhood, schools that don't serve their genius, healthcare uh, uh, disparities that still affect their body and their well-being. We as a nation must address these persistent inequalities or we will never fully achieve the strength and the possibility. Hope is the active conviction that despair will not have the last word. I believe right now, today, we have a historic opportunity to break the silence, to speak to the ugly past, and talk constructively about how we will move this nation forward. As the old African saying says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's about time we find the common ground and the common purpose to deal with the ugly past and make sure that generations ahead do not have to continue to mark disparities but can truly talk about a nation where, as our ancestors spoke from the good book, where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I heard him when he gave that speech. I thought it was good. Yes. Wow. Okay, I'm done. I've had it. <laughs> I'm working on my text. Oh, Judith, that turned out great. Hold it a little bit more in front of your face. That's excellent, Judith. Oh, please, please, please take a photo of that whole page and post it. I would love to share it with some people I've been talking about these classes with. And that looks great. I just uh, spent a long time on trying to get this cool old. Oh, I like the acres. Oh, I like their typeface. It's so hard to do. Nice. <laughs> So I'm going to do the 40 behind it real big. Anybody else want to show off your, your sketch so far? Yeah, I can. Whoops, just a minute. So I. Oh, nice. Oh, oh nice. Oh, that's so pretty. Ooh, I yeah. wanted to get in the word promise promise broken because oh, I that's like, that. like an important part of the story it's so true and yeah. i i had made the writing originally too small and i realized i could make it bigger so i haven't elaborated on making it nicer but i did make it bigger you are mi i think you're missing your eye in promise oh it that looks like part, it looks like part of the M. Thank you for that. Do you mind if I steal that from you, Carol, and add that to mine? No, I think it's an important part of the message. Yeah, I think there's no stealing in art. We can't ever really, um, you know, exactly fabricate what the other person did. We're just adding. It's it's kind of a dialogue of echoing each other. They do it all the time in art history, so <laughs> we're allowed to. Ellie, you want to show off, or you don't have to? You feel like it. I kind of cheated and just did the head. Like, oh my oh, god, oh. Ellie, that's, that's fantastic! That's yeah, so pretty. <laughs> Is that just only on your um, phone? You're able to get that detail, yeah. like a stylus, or um, I just kind of use my index finger, and I've used the program Eddie Bang Paint. Eddie Bang Paint? Yep. I'm writing that down. I need to check this out. That's really cool. But I love... Um, I'm sorry I didn't have a brown pencil now. Huh. That's yeah, beautiful. Go at it with my, uh, with my watercolors later. But... Excellent. You really nailed it. That's a, quite a likeness. I think someone I would like tell it. that it's... The safe. idea of just having a head is really beautiful. Yeah, that does the job. A lot easier, too. <laughs> so that's smart. Um, Patty? Did we, oh, we saw Patty's first. Right? Patty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's looking a little bit better. <laughs> 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 the first thing. But, but this is still, like, really bad, I just have to say. <laughs> well, okay. it's the it's a work in progress yeah that is better yeah <laughs> yeah 
great. That was ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, it's an attempt. <laughs> well, the important part is um, the awareness of, of what that symbol means. And, you know, I think if you understand the, sim the symbol behind it, like, that's a mule. And if you're just looking through your sketches and you're, you know, we're all here learning to drawing on this, learning to draw on this long quest of just becoming more artistic. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the important thing about anti-racist art classes too, is it's very much like the process of learning to draw. It's not just something you can do overnight. You can't go from racist to anti-racist. And there is no such thing as not racist. Everybody has, it, it's a verb. <laughs> You know, it's not a now. We're actively going to be continuing to take anti-racist actions, have anti-racist conversations. And because we are swimming in, an, in a racist environment, that is just like the, the water that we're in, um, racism is probably going to pop out um, without us even realizing it. And our job is just to become more aware, have conversations, learn, and um share in uh, whatever way we, we feel comfortable and or don't feel comfortable kind of get out of that comfort zone really. So thank you guys for being a part of this. Thank you. This was a thank you. Do you have time for a couple of quick technical That's questions? Great. Yeah, totally. I'm not going anywhere, but if you need to go, thanks for, for go. Thank okay. you all. Oh, great. So to see I see like hear the, the questions <laughs> and the answers. Um, I had shown my, I had shown a couple of my friends the Elijah Cummings um, drawing, the one that I posted mm -hmm. um, on the black paper. Mm -hmm. And they were saying I should put it up on Instagram. So I have an Instagram account, but I've not put anything zero on it. So cool. I can, I mean, I can figure out how to do that. But my technical question is, um, I did not take that photograph. I don't know who took the photograph. So even though the drawing is mine, do I have to, if I'm making it, you know, I mean, obviously I can show it to all my friends, but if I'm putting it in a public space, mm -hmm. is there some way that I have to and can Great question. give credit? Um, so I, I don't believe that you're required to give credit for the photograph. However, it's, it's, it's polite. That is a great thing to consider. And I'm, I'm yeah. looking right now to see the uh, source of that photo. And I think it actually, interestingly enough, is a, an Instagram photo from another Instagram post. Here we go. Yeah. Um, oh, do you have right there? Because I didn't get back to it. Do you have right there the um, whose it is? Yeah, I'm going to share the screen with you so you can see. It's a little bit of, it's, so it was originally from a tweet. And I don't know if the original tweet is from at Cyberplums or Rebirth. What you might do is say that it's from this um, article from the Philadelphia Inquirer. I imagine this might be a photo that was originally taken by the shelter. Um, Probably. Ooh, yeah, Patty, you missed a really heavy, and um, Ellie, it was a real heartbreaking um, call last week, and I'll have the replay up, I apologize, um, about the story of Elijah McLean, who is a Colorado resident who yeah. had anemia. He wore a mask because he got really cold even on regular nights and um he went to go buy a nice tea a few blocks from his house and there was an illegal chokehold they put on him for just being different and next thing you know um he died so it's it's really heartbreaking especially because he was this violinist who would he was so warm-hearted he would go to um shelters and play for the animals really yeah that's what this photo that that carol has um has illustrated is showing this is him just in his act of service going to play violin for the cats and Aww. it's it's such a i mean i'm starting to get all teary just talking about it right now the story is really beautifully written it was a great <laughs> i just i wept my way through it too but it was and that's here on 
in the group, anti-racist art classes. Um, it's this link right here. I'm going to have to post it again. But um, anyway, we won't Great. get too far into Great. it. But I'll do the replay. Uh, yeah. um, Thank you, Jessica. I'll, I'll so that the other question um, was you posted that imagine public safety, and I tried to find that again and couldn't find it either through you or online. I searched the web looking for like call 311 public safety and nothing. There was a lot about community policing that came up, but that's not what I was looking for. Because you, you showed us some examples and it looked like there were more that we could scroll through. If yeah. we got through. So they are a little tricky to find. I had to kind of because I originally found them on Instagram. Um, I will hunt those down and post them along with the replays today. So I will be sure to at Carol, <laughs> um, tag you on those. Thank you. Yeah, I went to some of uh, the woman who does posters, but those weren't there on her Instagram yeah. account. I'm not sure. Ellie, oh, you, hey, Ellie, what? Come on a question. Or did you need to go? Um, I just wanted to comment that there's a lady by who's like her professional kind of name is God is Gray. And she's been kind of following Elijah McLean's story and working with his mother. And she's been putting out to her Instagram and YouTube channel a lot of updates on good steps to take to work toward justice for him. And I don't know if there's any others that I should be aware of that are putting those kinds of updates. That's on Instagram. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. What was that? that Sorry. Instagram goddess gray. Yep. That's the one. Thank you. I'll look for her. That's assuming. also her YouTube channel. Okay. And Ellie, I think you may or may not be in our group, uh, the anti-racist art classes on the um, school.justgantinelli.com. If you um, get a chance to post anything along those lines, you just like add it here. That would be, okay. I would love to, to stay. Oh, that would be great. Thank great. you, Ellie. Okay. Yeah. I'll try and do that. Yeah. And if not, I'll try and, and hunt it down too. Um, okay. Sounds like a good one. And you'll look for that. Okay. Those were my two questions. Thank you so much for taking the time. To, yeah. And, thank you for your, and Patty, you're busy on your drawing. I can tell. Yes. And it's getting <laughs> Like seriously, from that hideous thing, <laughs> like it's getting so much better. Oh my god, I'm I'm so proud of myself. It's a still bad, I have to tell you, but <laughs> but much better oh, than. Oh yay! Oh. <laughs> well, you you know what he looked what? like to me before? He looked like um Eeyore. He looked like a stuffed donkey, and now he's looking Aww. like a, a real mule shape, like a. a so I thought it was cute before, as Jessica said, but it was oh, like you're going for an anatomical mule. <laughs> yeah, it's getting there. <laughs> Great. Good for you for persisting. Was it someone in this class who said that now that they're in COVID, they they better understand what it's like to walk out the front door and i remember you that, that. Harrison came oh, out. i repeated that to you okay so i'm telling them the story and i'm saying that the woman who told it to me said you know i'm not black i have no black friends i have some brown friends and we we got on brown mm -hmm. and i said well my brown friends are from jamaica and they said to me no people from jamaica are black and I said, no. And they said, it has nothing to do with the color of your skin. And so I just looked it up, but I didn't get, get to look it up enough. Where, it's, where the definition was the color of your skin in the first place that I found. So I wondered if anyone could shed any insight into this. Judith, I was thinking about this very thing today because I was drawing a portrait of Elijah McLean and mm -hmm. because of the lighting, his death, I mean, you know, it's not black anyway, but with the lighting, his skin looked really gorgeous purple in places and there were some reflections of blue. And I just thought, you know, our way of naming color 
arbitrary it's, in a way. It's, it's, you know, and when they called a, a mixed race person our first black president, it's like saying cafe au lait is coffee. You know, it's like, to me, all of these things have been... I'm so glad you're in this class. I love the way you describe things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I love that we're all here together. <laughs> anyway, I just, so I, I feel utterly uh, engaged with this question about color as an artist. I mean, you're, you've got, I think you're sitting in a black chair, Jessica. I mean, it's... Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I wonder how people... All right, so... Um, I do remember reading that there was a specific um, historian who now is like, lives in infamy, who created the color hierarchy and it was in i want to say the um 1800 it might have been even the 1700s something like that but he specifically said oh i remember it was in anti race how to be an anti-racist the book that they discussed um the specific historian who created the white yellow red black hierarchy which obviously is real racist. <laughs> um, I believe Brown tends to refer most often to people who are, for example, maybe Indian and don't have that darker complexion. Um, often people who are like some type of Hispanic or um, from different areas. But I think traditionally when you're talking about black people, you tend to be speaking of people of African origin but I don't think it's something you want to get too caught up on because again, it just goes back to that colorist hierarchy. Um, and you probably would want to maybe ask the, an individual, you know, how, how they, how they identify, I, I yeah. suppose. And uh, in the Temple Women Schmooze Wednesday, the topic was how do you identify yourself? Mm. And it wasn't about color, just in general, how do you identify yourself? And we have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, diverse ages. And it was interesting where people started, you know, whether they started, they were all women, whether someone started with Jewish or white or woman or American, um, you know, and then what was their second thing? So I offer that to all of you to think about if someone asked you, how do you identify politics. yourself? Absolutely. And isn't it, I, I was thinking about the same thing um, in terms of sexuality. And I was just thinking how really it's so strange that, you know, we, I'm sure like me, if you think about yourself, like there are all these things that you would say are the key to your personality, you know, teacher, artist, da, 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 da. but to come out and say like, I'm a gay person and I'm a this, 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 this. I think it's so strange that we have to put our sexuality like out there first um, or that's very commonly if you happen to have a you know non um non-traditional heterosexual yeah alignment that that that's the first thing that goes out there because really that's a very private thing um so you know you, you mm. see politicians yeah. like a gay gay mayor of blah 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 is running it's like <laughs> so my uh, my uh, go oh, ellie yeah go ahead yeah, I think that kind of stems from homophobia there, where it is something seen as very different. So you do have to kind of put that forward, and it is an identifier that people will judge you on. So some people kind of need to take that back and own it and build part of the personality off of it so that it can be theirs, and not just something used to insult them, I guess. Interesting. Oh, that's well, well phrased. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah. My, my theater teacher's husband, so my theater teacher's David's husband, Antonio, um, is both an actor but more a director. And when we are doing a um, talk back after a play that they've put out for us for our class each week, Antonio always starts by saying, hi, I'm Antonio. My preferred pronoun is they. Mm -hmm. I, I never heard anyone say it. I've seen it at the bottom of emails and letters, but he says it every single time. And I thought that was so interesting that he's, he's so um, uh, upfront about it. Not only upfront, but wanting us to get it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
I guess that's up front. Yeah. Right. No, I, I uh, encountered the same thing in a garden training where a fellow Texan and I went to uh, Portland, Oregon. And whenever they did the introductions, they said, you know, everybody, please stand up, tell us where you're from, your garden background, and your preferred pronoun. And to me, I'm like, yeah, like, this is my people. Really? And oh, uh, God. it really happy. shook my, my colleague because she had never even heard that that was a thing before. And to begin a conversation with it uh, really was unsettling. But toward, you know, after a while, she um, began to kind of come to terms that that would be important to people who, yeah, just identified outside of the gender binary. Um, and I was listening to an incredible podcast. Oh my gosh. It's called Dissect. I think I mentioned it last week when we talked about music. Um, and it deconstructs like note by note, lyric by lyric albums like um, uh, Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly, which is an incredible commentary on race and religion and um, black life but also Beyonce's Lemonade album, which is another one that's, that's really incredible. A lot of talk about that. I haven't heard it yet. L uh, listen to the podcast if you really want to go deep. And there was a- I can't go deep anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm deep enough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but there was a gay man who um, goes by the pronoun she. And I was just like, that's awesome. You know, like he's, he's a gay, she's a gay man. Um, but you know, that's just how she exists in the world. And it, it I've heard gay that. Man who's, is, uh, I'm curious, transgender or gay man who wants the pronoun she? A gay man who just identifies as a she. Yeah. And, I, you know, having watched a whole lot of um, YouTube makeup artists that are gay men who are always saying, hey, sisters, hey, girl, you know, it's a, it's a feminine. Yeah identifier that really does like fit eventually um but i love that this conversation has taken this turn because it goes back to the intersectionality i think of race and gender and sexuality and all of the kind of other um like us versus them like this this kind of bipolar mm. thing that we uh, come from traditionally that we're really starting to see is so much broader and really uh, everything is interconnected. So thank you for bringing that up, Judith. And thank you I, for creating a space where I can bring it up. Mm, totally. you know, oh, amen. I'm sure there are a lot of conversations in parts of the spheres that I'm in where they're having these conversations, but this is where I look forward to being uncensored. That, that and, means a lot. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Carol. Um, yeah, well, I would love to bring up, if we have time, just for something about white privilege, because I was talking with a friend, is that, who's my, my peer had group. A interesting conversation about white privilege myself. Let's give like yeah. a few more minutes. Yeah, and then well, I mean, work. what? Um, I mean, she's definitely against police violence. I mean, there's, she, she's absolutely, totally clear on that. But when it comes to privilege, she has a perspective that's based on her upbringing, which was though, even though her parents were educated, um, they were marginalized financially. So she had definitely um, lack of financial privilege, totally. I mean, she said even to the point where um, sometimes they didn't have enough to eat. She had four siblings. So she's talking with her black friend as an adult and her black friend is talking about white privilege. Her black friend had parents who could support her to go to college. She has two degrees. And Andrea, you know, later got an education, but as a young person, she couldn't go to college. I mean, so, she, so I'm saying, well, wait, you know, so I'm trying to say, well, Andrea, you, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not denying your experience, of course, but statistically, there's white privilege. So that con that part of the conversation did not get past that sticking point. I see Judith and Emily both have a comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. 
my understanding from this class, I didn't understand white privilege before, and from reading a little bit about me and, and white supremacy, is that white privilege is really not about financial. It's about being able to walk out the front door and not be afraid. And among other things, yeah. Yeah, it's about walking down the street and seeing a policeman walk towards you and not tensing up and cringing and worrying. And that to me was so eye-opening. If I got nothing out of starting this class, that was the most important thing. Hey. Hi! Hey, look who's here! Hi! Hi, Patty! How are Hello. you guys? Sorry for You're my... good! We yeah, were missing you! Yeah, I missed you too. <laughs> but I'm here finally. Good to see you. We were just having a brief little discussion about white privilege, and um, then we're going to dive into a conversation today about 40 acres and a mule and reparations. So, some big topics. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm ready. <laughs> anyway, I, Carol said, Carol told an anecdote um, about. A, a friend who uh, was looking at white privilege from the fact that she was raised in a poor family. I made the comment that I thought white privilege was more about being able to walk out the door without being afraid. And Jessica was about to make a comment. Well, Ellie, I was interested in what you had to say too. Um, looks like you had a comment. Oh, yeah. I think it's just that white privilege, it basically just means that being white will never be an obstacle for you in the same way being black will. There are other kinds of privilege like wealth and things, but basically whiteness is never going to be a problem for anybody. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think of Judith, your example of the policy at your apartment complex that th those do still exist in some areas where certain um, races are not welcome to live in certain areas. And even if it's not explicitly in writing, that d does still, um, it is still enacted. Uh, there are still lawsuits for other just blatant um, acts of racism about disenfranchising people from land or making it more difficult for them to get um, all kinds of assistance that is, is easily given to white people. Um, so, I mean, there's so many different ways that black people have been aggressed upon. So we, we've talked a little bit about microaggressions and it's something that is just, it's invisible to people who have this privilege. And I, I kind of hate the term privilege because it makes it sound, it, it goes back to the fact that there's a hierarchy and you're sitting at the top, top of the hierarchy. Um, one of the best examples of illustrating that white privilege is if you've ever heard of the, the game where a teacher would have everybody line up at the front of the classroom and they say, okay, take a step black, a step back if you are um, a, a woman, take a step back if you are black, take a step back, you know, if you grew up in a household with, you know, blah, blah, blah. And by the time it, they're ready to play the game where everybody gets to shoot their paper ball into the trash can at the end of the room, um, it's really clear, you know, going through all the checklist of privileges um, that there are some people way in the back of the room. It's going to be a lot harder for them to make that that shot. Uh, but to the people in the front of the room, the white males from a middle class background, they can't see everybody behind them. They don't know the struggle oh that my God. they're going through. Wow. They're blind to it. And the, to the people in the back of the room, they're saying like, hey, this is so unfair. Like, what's going on? And the guy in the front's just like, what are you talking about? Let's play this game. Let's go. Hmm. So I thought you were going to tell a similar story. Have you all seen the movie Freedom Writers? Yes, I was thinking about that movie too. Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't seen it for so long. Years ago, Judith, it was years ago? Yes. Yes. It's a uh, Hillary, what's her name? Hillary Swank. Yeah. yeah. Is a teacher in um, uh, a, a, a bad school in Harlem. Mm -hmm. It's worth seeing again just for the scene where she's trying to get the, the Chinese 
cohort and the Hispanic cohort and the Italian cohort to understand that they're all the same. And she puts them on a line and it's step back if you've had a friend who's been killed and step back. Yeah. So that's a, but what you just told, I, I, I'm, that makes such an impact. Like, I don't know how to draw that, but I'm going to draw it in a way to remind <laughs> myself that story. 